5,000 units. I, I forget the unit on vitamin D, but um, it's a lot bigger. It's like 10 times more than we thought we needed. And we know that 80% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. So we put it in our milk, right? We add vitamin D fortified. If you look at you know gallons of milk, it's vitamin D fortified. Unless you drink it straight out of the bulk tank at a farm, that's not vitamin D fortified. So we try to boost vitamin D levels because we're not all out in the sunshine, right? Some of us work in, our, uh, in class, so you're not able to bask in the sun. Although I see students sometimes taking advantage of it in our stairwells where we have those big windows and you get some vitamin D that way. But if you um, have issues with depression and poor immune function, sometimes a vitamin D supplement can do wonders. And they're really small little gel tabs. They're cheap to buy. And 2,000 is a good unit to start with. And they um, can make a big difference for people, especially if you're inside a lot. And then excretion. We excrete waste like urea through our sweat. It's the same waste product we see in urine as well. That's why people tend to get stinky when they have a lot of sweat and then that dries on their t-shirt. Um, that can give kind of a strong odor after a while. So that's why we need to shower on a regular basis. So looking at the structure of skin, the two major layers of the skin are the epidermis and the dermis. Remember the top layer, the dead layer, is the epidermis, except for the very most bottom layer, the stratum basally, we know undergoes mitosis. So there's several different strata. We talked about the top and the bottom one in lab, but there's a total of five layers. These cells change from the bottom as they work their way to the top. And then if we look at the dermis, we know that's the thicker structural layer of the skin. It has what we call cleavage lines that allows the skin to kind of maintain its same uh, uniformity and direction. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we already mentioned when we talked about the tissues that epithelial tissues have uh, no blood vessels. So it's avascular, the epidermis. So all this oxygen has to diffuse through those membranes of the epidermis from the dermis. So the blood vessels are found in the dermis, and those gases diffuse by simple diffusion into the epidermis to supply those cells. And then as it gets closer and closer to the surface, further from that blood supply, they fill with more and more keratin, and those cells die and slough off. So when we look at the layers, these are the five layers. The very bottom layer is the stratum basally, and those are cells that are living, and they contain melanin to give our skin its color. And then we have the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and then lastly, the stratum corneum. It's not important that you memorize the characteristics of each layer. That's just, I think, factoid information that's not going to affect your practice in the future. But just so you know that it's not just the stratum basally, and then everything's dead from beyond. It's a process. These cells undergo mitosis. One cell stays to maintain the layer of the stratum basally, and one cell moves upward. And then they move their way up, and you'll notice they get more and more squamous as they reach the surface. And they lose their cellular contents. All they get, you know, in terms of concentration, are is this keratin. And then there's lipids between the cells that keep the cells moist. And that's why as we age, we need to keep adding moisturizer. Or if you want to slow the aging process, take good care of your skin. Moisturize your face. Moisturize the skin on your hands and arms and legs um, every day, like after the shower. It's good to get a big thing of lotion, keep it in your bathroom so you can slather it on right after your shower. And you'll, you'll enjoy a healthier, younger-looking skin you know, into your 60s and 70s. I mean, we're all going to age, but some age rapidly and some not. And a, a lotion has a lot to do with um, how the skin ages, so just keeping that, that layer there. So again, the stratum basally is the single layer of living cells that undergo mitosis, and some of those cells are melanocytes to secrete melanin. And the top layer is dead cells. That's the stratum corneum. And most of the thickness of our epidermis is the stratum corneum. So if you add up all the cells that we shed, 40 pounds. That's what we talked about in grandma's mattress that we borrow and hear it, right, for your kids. And it's so heavy because it's full of 
a lifetime of skin cells. All right, um, again, we can just see the thickness when we look at it in a microscope. You can see how see-through these cells are because they don't have any organelles. It's just keratin filling those cells. And then we can see when you get to the bottom layer, the stra uh, stratum basally, the cells are darker because they have a visible nucleus. And some of those cells stain brown because of the melanin they contain. So the dermis also contains, remember that tissue, dense irregular collagenous. So that's what gives this, the dermis its strength, are those collagen fibers, which those collagen fibers break down over time. We talked about that a little bit before, that that's what causes uh, wrinkles, is the collagen fibers breaking down. And we also lose our fatty layer as we age. Tattoos, we know that they have to go into the dermis of the skin in order to stay there. And if they go too far, they end in this, into the hypodermis, which is full of adipose, and then they get blurry because that ink kind of settles into the lipid droplets of the fatty layer. So keeping it in the dermis um, is important. Same thing with sutures. When we are closing a, an, an incision, we have to make sure that suture gets into the dermis and pulls those two edges together. We don't want to go into the epidermis because there's no integrity there. Those are loose loose dying cells. And our skin is kind of arranged in these cleavage lines. And doctors know that if they, if they make an incision parallel to the cleavage lines, there would be little to no scarring. So that's a big part of cosmetic surgery, is making sure that those incisions where you're pulling on the skin and pulling it up to remove wrinkles or removing fat or building bone or cartilage, whatever, um, they follow those cleavage lines. But of course, we know when you fall and scrape your knee, a good one on your bicycle as a child, that's not going to follow cleavage lines. And maybe some of you have scars today that you brought in from childhood or just from injuries that you know happened without um, any planning or ability to heal. So we talked about the hypodermis lab also. It is not part of the skin. It's made up of fat and a realer tissue. We also find macrophages in the fat cells, so it allows, among the fat cells, it also allows a little bit of um, infection prevention as we get deeper cuts into the fatty layer. So, but it's not enough to really challenge, you know, a lot of bacteria, but it does have some ability to clean up the area. And um, when cells die, that's taken in by macrophages. We call this the sub-Q region we talked about, the hypodermis, and that's where um, we have blood vessels, and that's those cells get bigger and bigger. So the hypodermis can become infinitely large. Like if you watch television, my 600-pound life, right? So we know that people can get very large based on the ability of the, epi uh, the, the, epi the hypodermis, those adipose cells, to get larger and larger. And so what asked in class earlier, why is that? Well, the body is always preparing for survival and famine. So if we have excess calories in, the body's going to store it because the body doesn't know when that food supply is going to go away. So we always store extra, extra calories in our fat cells. Now, a way to prevent that extra storage is if we exercise and train, we build more mitochondria and more glycogen stores in our liver and muscles. So if we store excess calories as glycogen in liver and muscles, that's less that's left over to store in our fat cells. So that's why people can say that they lost a bunch of weight by simply weight training because they built muscle and glycogen stores. And aerobic exercise is the best way to build more mitochondria and glycogen stores, but we still build some with weight training. So muscles use more energy as well. So when you have resting muscle of a larger mass, that burns up energy and, and uses glucose. So just those simple things to make sure there's less extra at the end of our day. And of course, watching when we eat, right? Making sure that we have healthy calories coming in. So we talk about empty calories. We know what empty calories are. It just means foods that have little to no nutrition. They have calories, but no nutrition. For example, a donut. A donut has little to no nutrition. It has energy, but your body doesn't use the byproducts of that for as coenzymes for metabolism. And people find when they eat healthy and clean that their mental clarity is better. They have less headaches, less body aches, more energy, because they're supplying those extra 
cofactors and coenzymes for metabolism, making their body um, very efficient in how it burns fuel. So the sub-Q layer is the, the hypodermis. That's where medicines are injected. So when we want medicine to be diffused slowly throughout the body, we put it into the sub-Q region. So insulin and blood thinners like heparin or Lovenox are popular medicines that go into the sub-Q region. Things like vaccinations, those usually go into the muscular region, but not always. Sometimes dog vaccinations, we tent the skin and poke it right through the skin and lay it right under the skin on top of that hypodermis. So it just depends on the medicine. Um, when we look at the color of the skin, there's different pi uh, pigments that affect color. Melanin is the primary one. So melanin is, is what gives the skin its brown color, varying shades of brown. And it's not the number of melanocytes, but it's the amount of melanin they produce. So we all have the same number of melanocytes, but it's the amount of melanin or how active those melanocytes are. So that's a test question. I can tell you that right now. So make sure you know it's not the number of melanocytes. It's the amount of melanin that determines the color of our skin. And then we have abnormal melanin production that are found in moles and freckles. But albinism, being an albino, is the absence of melanin, so there's no color to the skin. Those people have very, very white skin. And carotene is a yellow pigment. Sometimes um, when people, like a friend of ours, um, was giving their baby a lot of carrots, their baby only liked carrots, and carotene is a big part of carrots, and the baby's skin actually turns slightly yellow because of all the carotene in the diet. So that can give the skin a, a slightly yellow color, too. R really? <laughs> As a baby or adults? Mm. Young? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems to happen with the little ones. And then the amount of blood circul circulating through the skin. Some people have you know, a lot of blood vessels right near the surface that gives the skin a more reddish hue. Um, when we're embarrassed, we have that surge of uh, blood to the surface. Um, anger, inflammation, we know, causes capillaries to dilate. So whenever you see red near the surface of the skin, you got to think capillaries are dilating, and we're seeing that excess blood flow to the skin. And to dilate just means to get bigger. Cyanosis is the color that we get when there's low oxygen. It doesn't mean we're, our blood is blue. It just means that there's less oxygen in the blood. It's a darker red color. And the way, skin, or the way light passes through our skin and reflects back to our eyes, it gives a bluish hue. But it doesn't mean that the skin or that the uh, blood is blue. And that's a bad sign. When we see a patient with blue lips or blue skin, you know, we need to be concerned about that. And kids, that is a late sign of low oxygen in kids. So we need to be really concerned if children have a cyanosis or a cyanotic color. Cyan is the number for is the word for blue in the world of art too. So that's where that term cyanosis comes from, blue. And our lips are red because they lack many of the layers that we see of the strata and those stratum corneum, we don't have those on the lips because the lips are, need to be very sensitive, right? So we don't have as many layers, protective layers, and that's why, like me today, I've noticed my lips are very dry, and the, as the weather gets cooler, we lose more of that moisture off the surface. So we notice that our lips are the first you know, parts of our body that need extra moisture when there's less moisture in the air. So that's, and they're red because of less layers. We can see the blood vessels more easily in that dermal layer on our lips. So other skin structures that we saw, the hair, the glands, we talked about all those in lab. You should be aware of those. Just know that um, the ceruminous glands are modified sweat glands in the ear that secrete wax instead of sweat. And the mammary glands in the breast secrete milk instead of sweat. So we have some modified sweat glands that have a different function in the body. When you look at the different glands, I'm not going to ask you to identify them in a microscope slide. We already did that. But there's two types of sweat glands. Merocrine are the ones that are ecrine is another name. Um, they're the most common. Uh, they're for temperature control. They produce a lot of sweat. But apocrine, those are the ones that increase in number at puberty, and that contributes to body odor. So the armpits, the genital region, and the anal area is where we find these apocrine glands. And those are the larger glands we saw in the skin model. 
and those, like I say, activate with puberty. Pimples are a problem with the oil glands. They get uh, bacteria in there, and then it causes an inflammatory response. So sometimes the only way to treat that is through antibiotics. So some people, like my daughter got married this summer, and because of stress and hormones, who knows what, she just had the worst acne, I think, of her entire life, and she was 23. And she was just in tears. It was like five days before her wedding, and she's like, how am I going to cont contain all this acne? And I'm like, you know what? We're going to the doctor, and we're going to ask for an antibiotic. And sure enough, by Saturday of her wedding, her face was clear. So if you know someone who is struggling and needs a quick heal, we don't like to overuse antibiotics, obviously, right? And the doctor, you know, told her that. But you know, hopefully you only get married once, right? And that was um, a reason to kind of just go with that and try antibiotics. So burns are damaged to the skin. They're, they're uh, rated by degree. So the first degree burn is just uh, damage to the epidermis. So they hurt and they look red because the epidermis is damaged. You see the blood from the dermis shining through more, kind of like the lips, right? And that is a suntan or sunburn, sunburn, sorry. So it's painful because those sensory receptors are activated, they're damaged, heals in a couple days. You can live with that but it does do damage to the skin over time. Lots of sunburns in childhood in the early uh, teens and 20s increases the risk for skin cancer later on and increases the aging process. Second degree burns, we have damage to the epidermis and part of the dermis, so we see peeling away occur. Blisters form, you burn yourself on the stove and a little bubble forms, that's a second degree burn. Or if you burn your, do a really bad sunburn and it peels, that is also a second degree burn. So anytime we see a break in the skin, second degree burn. And that takes longer to heal, three to four weeks to heal completely. And third degree burns, we're gonna see layers of moist tissue underneath. So if you start to see fat, muscle, or bone, you know that that's a third degree burn. And those don't hurt because if we have just the um, layers of the epidermis and dermis and those connective tissues, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of nerve supply in there, and people can have severe burns and not know it. And the, whenever we have burns of this degree, um, major risk for infection. So here's a third degree burn. So first degree, second degree, third degree. Pretty nasty. So we have something that we use in the clinical environment called the rule of nines. When someone comes in and has been burned at work or burned by a fire, um, we're gonna look at what percentage of their body is damaged by the burn and we can determine how serious of our interventions need to be or what their risk of death is. So each leg represents 9% of the body, each arm is 4.5, so if they fell into some hot water and burned both arms, that would be 9%. So that's why they call it the rule of nines, is it kind of adds up to nines, factors of nine. So the whole head is 4.5%. So. Um, Critical is 25% of the body has second degree burns or 10% has third degree burns. So these people are usually at risk for electrolyte loss and infection, so they need to be hospitalized. And third degree burns require skin grafts because it's not going to heal. When the epidermis and the hypodermis are, and the dermis are gone, we need to replace that with skin from somewhere else. I had a student that had severe burns from kicking a, a lighted can of gasoline. They filled a soda can with gasoline and they were kicking it back and forth. And when he kicked it, it exploded and started his pants on fire and worked all the way up and his whole body was on fire. So he had to get skin grafts throughout his life because these skin grafts start to shrink over time and then they lose their elasticity. So they have to peel them off and put new ones on. So, and it wasn't so much the pain of the skin graft, it's where they got the skin graft. They had to create like little road rashes to get the skin from his butt and thighs because that's where we have extra skin to replace those areas. Yes? Yeah? and they have to get replaced, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a process and it's painful. So clinical disorders of the skin, we already talked about acne is infection in the oil glands. We also have viral infections that live in the nerve endings of the skin. So these are very painful viruses when they crop up and cause ruptures on the surface. There is a vaccine for chicken pox and the measles, so that's good, but cold sores are still going around. That's herpes simplex one. Herpes simplex 2 is genital herpes, and they can intermix. 
So if a person has a cold sore and has, does oral sex on someone who has a break in the skin down there, they can transmit genital herpes, and the other way around. A person has chapped lips doing oral sex on someone with genital herpes, they can get oral herpes. But they prefer their specific areas, but they can intermix. And it's one of those things, too, do people you know, put the lights on and do a full body check before engaging in intercourse to know the status of everybody? Probably not, right? So people who are you know, considering uh, that kind of a relationship should talk about STDs prior to the time that you know, that relationship begins. So um, it's out there, and it can cause real issues for women, especially during childbirth. If they have an active herpes lesion in the genital area, they'll have to do a C-section to deliver that baby because it puts the baby at risk to pass through an area where there's an active herpes infection. And with that being said, good people do have herpes because it is passed, you know, in normal daily living, sharing drinks at the water fountain, sharing water bottles on the sports bench. Um, that's how it gets passed along, and obviously intercourse through um, genital herpes, but it happens to good people. So if you or someone you know has it, that doesn't mean you're just going to write them off because they're horrible people. Just, you know, you need to be treated, and people need to be smart when they have an active lesion. And talk about it and be honest so we don't spread it, and it doesn't affect, you know, children and babies. So cancer, or bed sores we already talked about in lab, when we cut off the oxygen supply by people having too much pressure on a bony area where the skin is, um, we need to keep people moving and keep shifting their position. And poor nutrition, which is poor protein in the diet, thin and on a lot of pain meds, those are the people at risk for bed sores because they're not, because they're on so many pain meds, they're not going to feel the pain. They're not going to move around enough. We need to really be diligent about that in the hospital setting, in the nursing homes. Just keep people moving. Get them off their bottoms. And that doesn't mean, like, if they like to sit in the chair or sleep in the chair, that's fine, but we just need to keep moving the, the weight and shifting, shifting weight and not just keeping it in one spot. It's easy, you know, people that work in healthcare, two hours can pass really fast, right? And then you realize, oh my gosh, you know, my patient's been in the same position. So that's why it takes a team approach. Nurses and CNAs have to work together on keeping patients moving. Cancer, the two first two cancers, basal cell and squamous cell, are the most common types of skin cancer, and they occur in people that have a lot of sun exposure over a lifetime. So people that just kind of ignore the sun, they think, oh, you know, I get tan, I look really good, I'm in my 20s, life is great, I'm just going to just keep on tanning. Um, when they get into their 50s and 60s is when they start to develop these sores on the face and the no on the nose or the lips or the shoulders, the back, that don't heal. And then those are skin cancer, they need to be removed. And when they remove them, they remove a large portion of the skin around that area to make sure they get it all. So it is very treatable, that's the good news, but it leaves pretty big scars. Like I know one guy, he um, sold resorts down in, or sold condos down in Florida, and half of his nose is gone because they had to remove so much over time because of chronic exposure to the sun. So if you like to be outside in the sun, you know, if you want to have a younger looking skin when you're in your 50s and 60s, you don't want to take care of your skin and not get too much exposure. Malignant melanoma, this is a really dangerous one. This is the one that can happen at any age, and it can start as simple as with a harmless mole that just gets a little funny looking over time. And this is what it looks like. We have the A, B, C, D, E rule for looking at melanoma. A, is, is it asymmetrical, like not completely round? B, does it have an uneven border? This one does. C, is its color changing? Is it a dark, dark black or blue? Um, D, what is the diameter of it? Is the diameter changing? And E, is it elevated? It satisfies all those crit criteria. It's good to be seen. So we need to always keep an eye on our moles and watch that. I know several people who have died of melanoma. I mean, I know their name. So it hits close to home, for sure. We had a, a doctor, pediatrician, who was, and red hair and freckles increases your risk. You have a genetic tendency toward melanoma. So if you expose yourself to sun on top of having the genetic predisposition, you're at higher risk. So I know someone who was a pediatrician, he had a beard, red hair, um, and a red beard, and he, when he was trimming his beard, he noticed a little dot in his beard. He went to be seen, and he already had active melanoma, had spread to his body, and he died as a young man in his 30s from melanoma. 
So it's a very serious condition that needs to be watched carefully. And just knowing, looking at your moles, I know I have a friend who's a redhead. She has to go in every three months and do a full body check on all her moles because she has some atypical moles that um, they need to watch. So as we age, what do we get to look forward to? Collagen fibers decrease, so our skin is, and elastic fibers decrease, so we get less resiliency to the skin. It starts to droop. We lose fat in the hypodermis, so we get wrinkles and we get chilly because of that. What temperature do we keep the nursing homes at, those of you that work in the nursing homes? Hot. <laughs> like 85, and they have a sweater and a turtleneck on, right, because of less fat. So we'll pick up on Wednesday with the skeletal system. Or skeletal system.